Amen. Good singing tonight. I've noted with you that Christmas carols tell the whole story. We've also been noticing on some of these selections that the ladies have made that many of our hymns include a verse that talks about the incarnation because the coming of Christ is at the heart of God's redemptive purposes for us. I love to celebrate the fact that our hope is resting in Him and Him alone because there are days when we don't do so well. <laughs> and it was based upon our merits or our performance, we would be a people in desperate, a desperate place. Well, I had determined earlier to take some time in the Pauline epistles and think about Christmas, the coming of Christ from his perspective, and again, there's more there than I ever anticipated. It is as well woven into the epistles. Um, if he's going to tell the church how to live and what salvation means in our lives from day to day, he's going to constantly be referencing the incarnate Christ. So we started in Philippians 2, and Paul is calling the people at Philippi to a like-mindedness to Christ. Let this particular mind be in you. Let your way of thinking, your attitude, your spirit look like this. And then he talks about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ setting aside his glory uh, and coming to earth and moving toward the cross and paying our penalty and then being highly exalted at the right hand of the Father. Last week, we turned to Romans chapter 5, because in that chapter, when Paul is leading us through an understanding of salvation, he celebrates the fact that we are justified by faith. That means God has reckoned us judicially righteous. Uh, the righteousness uh, that is ours is foreign to us. It's the righteousness of Christ. It's not our righteousness. And then he goes on to talk about it in terms of the first Adam. We're all poisoned by sin because of the first Adam. But then he talks about the last Adam. He talks about the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that his life and his death um, brings us uh, saving grace. And so uh, we are either in Adam or in Christ. We're visiting tonight a little bit in our prayer time about the book of Psalms and how the book of Psalms shows you a blessed man and an ungodly wicked man. And to my recollection, all but 30 of the Psalms talk about ungodly wicked men talks about society we live in. And it starts by introducing the fact that they will not stand before God. They don't have a chance before God. And so even as that's the book of Psalms unfolds, uh, date, the Davidic covenant and the work of God in advancing his purposes, we see that there are only two groups of people. Those that are uh, wicked, unbelieving, and those that are blessed and believing. Well, the same thing is true from Romans 5. You're either in Christ or you're in Adam. And so I think that helps us. That settles our heart a bit. That keeps us clear as we approach the Word of God. I did not know just a minute ago that you ladies are doing some memory work on Wednesday nights from Colossians 1. And that's where we're turning tonight, Colossians 1. So Laura and I are talking so much together that I had no idea that was going on. You're already in verse number 14, so you pray for us. If you have any counsel, just let us know. And she said, we're memorizing that. I said, great. <laughs> we're down to verse number 14, she said. And I said, well, I don't think I'm going to get to verse 14 tonight. Maybe. But I put this in part one yeah, because next week I intend to follow with part two because I am, am burdened, as you are, to approach a new year uh, in terms of keeping Christ central keeping Christ exalted, keeping Christ before us. And so I think our turning to Colossians will help us with that. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, Colossians chapter number one, he's apostle by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, Timothy's with him, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace or favor, be unto you and peace, the tranquility that comes because of grace, and that comes from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in our studies together, we've noticed, and when we went through the book of Colossians, we noticed that there's always that element of referencing and re-referencing the Lord Jesus Christ. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ, verse 1. This grace and peace is from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Verse number three, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, Paul, in the inspiration of the Spirit, is constantly standing Christ before us. My understanding, I think yours as well, would be that's because Christ was always before him. He was in prison. This is a prison epistle. And he hears about a young church, uh, uh, believers, from one that reports from Colossae that there's some, there's some challenges there. Uh, there's some false teachers who are um, advancing the idea that there is something more for us in addition to what Christ has done for us and has given to us. There's no indication from the, the lack of strength, and I'm, I'm saying that reverently in contrast to the book of Galatians. Now, Paul just comes out firing in the book of Galatians because there seemed to be some willfulness and some rebellion there, and he's, he's really challenging that. The spirit in which he writes the Colossians seems to indicate that these are people who are spiritually mature and don't know better. These are not people who are willfully following for some false teacher. I think we can appreciate that because when somebody comes along and they say, you know what, you want to go to the next level spiritually? You want to know God in a greater way? You want more spiritual strength? I mean, who of us would say, no, thank you. <laughs> but because you're discerning, because you've been in the Bible, you know if the next thing they say is, you know what, there, there's something else beyond Christ then you're starting to take steps back because you know that cannot be true. Because what he just said depreciates what Jesus Christ did and who Jesus Christ is and what God gave us in Jesus Christ. And so I sense here that Paul is hearing uh, a troubling report, but really from people who are undiscerning. They, they, they are being protected now as Paul writes this letter. So, so Satan's primary target is always... The church's primary hope. Satan takes aim at the Lord Jesus Christ because our hope is in, as we've sung this evening, our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing that Paul does is communicates favor and peace to his readers. Why did he do that? Do you ever ask those questions of the text of Scripture? I hope you will. And if you, if you don't, I hope you start. Why does he communicate grace and peace? Because <laughs> they need grace and peace. Because they're agitated. Right? They're agitated. There are things going on that, that are unsettling. So he communicates favor and peace to his readers because that's what they are in need of. That, that will help them in regards to what he's about to say to them because he's going to help them think right. He's going to help them believe right. And he knows that God desires to provide grace and peace to these dear people through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So fundamentally, the book is reminding us that the truth about Jesus Christ is the source of our hope. Uh, Christ alone is the source of our hope. And so any attack on Jesus Christ would be a primary weapon of Satan. And Satan's target typically is unsuspecting, immature believers who are undiscerning. They're uninformed. Why is it that we just are... are, are committed without any variation to bring this truth out every time we get together. Because that's the only thing that's going to give you and me discernment. That's the only thing that's going to protect us. Uh, in fact, the assumption that we know and the assumption that we're strong, the assumption that we can see the deceptions of the angel of light is only that. It's an assumption. We need uh, uh, deep uh, drinks from the Word of God. And so what Paul's going to do is he's going to teach them truth. They're undiscerning, they're uninformed, they're immature. And Satan's weaponry is not, hey, I, come over here, I'm going to take you out. That's not the way it works. Satan's weaponry is sending somebody along to say, I've got some mysterious insights for you. And anytime that happens, if you're reading a book, or you're hearing a message, just start stepping back. I'm, I'm going to help you understand how to, how to live on a higher level. I'm going to give you some fresh insights. And the apostle answers it with what? Basics for believers. Keep that phrase in your mind. Paul's answer to the attack of false teachers time and time again is what? It's the same truth that we believed when we got saved. It's basic for belief. Takes us right back to the start.
He's always going to move us right back to Jesus Christ. Fundamental realities, gospel reminders. Why? Because that's where our faith rests. That's where the enemy's attacking. Do you remember when Ken Ham first started his things about uh, evolution versus creation? He had those pictures of a castle and he had a foundation there and he was pointing out the fact that Satan is so smart that he's constantly aiming at the foundation. And we're so silly sometimes that we're shooting at peripherals. Because if Satan can take out the foundation, in his case, talking about creation, then he has, will be the undoing of everything else we hope in. If Satan can take out Jesus Christ and he alone is our hope, oh, we're in trouble, right? If he can diminish who Jesus Christ is. And so the apostles' pro approach is going back to the basics. Simply put, the magnification of the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is, what he's done, what he's promised, and what that means for those who trust him. Look for that when you begin reading again this year in the New Testament epistles. Paul magnifies the Lord Jesus Christ in regards to who he is, what he has done, what he has promised, and what that means for all who are trusting in him. Well, this is a source of great help for us. This has been the content of several months of our study in Colossians in previous days and more recent in the Sunday school instruction that constantly heads us to the New Testament to see that Christ is the fulfillment of everything those Old Testament people were hoping for. So listen, as Paul continues in verse 3, we have thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ praying always for you. This is not a pep talk. This is not a spiritual pep talk. Uh, Paul is not trying to use psychology to get those people feeling good so they'll hear his message. You know what he's doing? He's providing an underpinning for the fact that God's already done everything that needs to be done through Christ. Look at it in verse number four. Here's the apostle. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, back to basics, of the love which you have to all the saints... Paul says, what we're hearing is about your faith. What we're hearing is about your love. Verse number five, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Now, some commentators understand there to be three different things there, and that's possible. Your faith, the love, and the hope. Others suggest that the hope is, is underneath the, the faith and the love. The reason that there's Evidence of faith and evidence of love is because these people are settled in their hope. And I think that fits when you look at the second part of verse number five. Okay, where'd that come from? Where'd the hope come from? Whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. So somebody's coming along with something new. Somebody's coming along with something interesting and attractive and alluring and Paul steps forward and says, let's talk about the fruit that is already there. Let's talk about what Christ has done for you. Let's talk about the settled hope that is yours. And let's talk about where that came from. That didn't come from some mysterious insight. Epaphras or somebody else just preached the gospel to you. And you believed it. And that settled everything. And that is your foundation. And that is the place where the apostle goes to answer the attack of those would-be uh, leaders who would lead those undiscerning people in the wrong direction. Look at it in verse number 6. And he's just referenced the truth of the gospel, verse number 6, which is coming to you. But now he expands out and says, you know what, this is, this is how God's doing what he's doing. As it is in all the world, the same gospel you heard is the same gospel they heard at Ephesus and Philippi and Thessalonica and Corinth. And all those places, what is it doing? Well, it's doing what Romans 1.16 says. It's the power of God into salvation, and it brings forth fruit. It pulls it right back to where they are, as it doth also in you. When did it start producing fruit in them? Next phrase of verse 6, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. He talks about the word of the truth of the gospel in verse 5. He talks about the grace of God in truth in verse number 6. He heads them back 
to when they heard the gospel. Now, they heard it from a man named Epaphras, verse number 7. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Now, why would he say this? Well, he'd say this, first of all, to take them back to the roots, right? This is where it started. Epaphras preached the gospel unto you. Why would he call him a faithful minister of Christ? Because that immediately puts the false teachers in another category. There are unfaithful ones who are teaching you something else. And I want to remind you that you came to Christ through the faithful preaching of the gospel by a man named Epaphras, who is our dear fellow servant, which is very important because Paul is, in a sense, a chief apostle here. And he says, now, Epaphras is for you a faithful minister of Christ. He told you the truth. That's why the fruit is there. Who also, verse number eight, he's also the one who brought me the message that has precipitated this letter to you. Who also declared unto us your love in the spirit. He told us about this fruit. And Paul says there's supernatural life there at Colossae. And that supernatural life that is there is because you have heard and received and believed and embraced Jesus Christ. Now, Paul's excited about that, thankful for that, pointing the believers back there so they can get their feet back under them. Now, I think this is helpful personally. Well, Satan is ruthless in his attack on us, folks. He would love nothing better than to just essentially paralyze us by constantly reminding us of our failures. He diminishes God's truth, diminishes God's truth to lead us into sin, and then he just seems to, to, to be so good <laughs> at communicating God's condemnation when we sin. He appreciates the truth to get us to sin, and then he is very good at taking the scriptures taking the truth and communicating condemnation to us. And so what he's doing here is getting the believer's feet back under them. And that's what we need. We need to keep going back to where spiritual life began and allow that to be used of God to protect us. Get our attention riveted again on Jesus Christ. This, again, is not psychology. This is the proper use of truth. This is taking us back to where our hope is, to what we have believed. Now, Paul says the evidence is in. The evidence is in, folks, and the gospel is bearing fruit among you. And that is because of faith in Christ alone. And the evidence there is love for God and for others. And a hope that's to be realized. All of this has been produced by the Holy Spirit through gospel preaching. The implication already is that you don't need anything else. There's nothing else for you. From day one, life has been evident. The truth about Christ is the source of our hope. The attack on Jesus Christ is the primary weapon of Satan. He attacks the foundation. Paul's response in verse number nine for this cause, the cause of the things that he's just said, we also since the day we heard of it, or we heard it, excuse me, do not cease to pray for you. So I'm constantly talking to the Lord about this. And to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He says, growing in the knowledge of Christ is what you need versus some deeper knowledge that is being uh, promoted among you. Now, no, what you need to do is understand who Christ is. You need to grow in knowledge of his will and wisdom and spiritual understanding. And when you do that, verse number 10 says, you'll be able to walk worthy that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And as you're walking worthy and producing fruit and increasing the knowledge of God, you also will be strengthened, verse number 11, with all might. According to his glorious power, you don't need some new source of power. There's no higher level which you're going to live on. There's no power greater than the resurrection power that you need. 
unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Here again, the idea is endurance and steadfastness and joy. And then there's verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. What has he done? Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom, that is his Son, the Son of his love, his dear Son, in whom, in that one, we have redemption through his blood. It's already settled. The forgiveness of sins. The sins have been covered up and carried away. And then he breaks into what brings us to our focus in, in Christmas and incarnation, who is the image of the invisible God. This is who this dear son is, the firstborn of every creature. Not only that, as Hebrews tells us and John 1 tells us, for by him were all things created. Those things that are in heaven, those things that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Evidently, these false teachers had all kinds of special ways to deal with demons and angels and all of the different unseen things. And Paul just says, you know, he created all those. All things were created by him and for him. In verse 17, he is before all things and by him all things consist. In addition to that, he's the head of the body, which is the church, who was the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. The point I think Paul makes here is that wanting something more is an indication that we do not understand what we have. <laughs> wanting something more is an indication that we do not yet understand nor are we enjoying what we have in Christ. In Paul's gospel, the goal is no mystic, awe-inspiring apprehension of divine mysteries that are reserved for some kind of spiritual elite. What he's talking about is really a, a ready grasp of what is already ours in Christ so that we can better discern what the will of God demands, so that we can walk worthy so that we can walk with understanding, we can walk with obedience. This so-called special knowledge and power produces the opposite of humility and meekness. And I'll tell you, it's very distressing. When somebody preaches a message or writes a book and tells you, I got, I got a secret for you now. And then you embrace it. And then you start trying to apply that to your own life. And two weeks later, you find yourself right where you were. It's very disheartening. Because somebody just sold you something that's supposed to take you to the next level. And you find out two weeks later, you got the same flesh you had two weeks earlier. And you don't have any new special insights. And here Paul says, would you get back to the reality of the gospel, the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ? What greater power could you have than resurrection power? That, that took you as dead in your trespasses and sins and gave you life. What, what more can you have than everything that Christ has? The inheritance that he has is ours. So somebody comes along and says, you can have more. And you're thinking, how could I have more? How could you have more understanding than simply growing in your understanding, your knowledge, your appreciation for who Christ is? I think there's another part of this that I'll at least throw out for you tonight to give some thought to. Because I've read some of these things. I've heard some of these things. My heart yearns for something more sometimes. And I expect that underneath some of this is a misunderstanding of the idea that somehow we're going to experience paradise down here. <laughs> we're not. It's not going to happen. Most of what you received in Christ is waiting for you there. Right? New body. Purity, no sin, all of the loveliness of what is truly paradise. And I think sometimes one of the things that gets us messed up is somebody comes along and they describe a, a spiritual life that sounds like paradise. Again, you and I are stepping back. Because if he has that actually, then he's got more than Paul had according to Romans 7. Because Paul was slugging it out spiritually. Paul was struggling and he was honest enough to say, 
Let me give you a picture of what happens in me every time I determine to do right. There's another principle in me that says, oh, no, you don't. And he says, this is me walking through life spiritually. And so there's a great need for us as well to understand and remember that paradise awaits us in God's presence. It's not something we're going to find on this side of heaven. And celebrating his dear son. I'm just taking that phrase from the end of verse number 13. His dear son is the son of his love. Involves, first of all, knowing him. Knowing him. And I, again, I think this is written, well, I think the, the timing of it, as far as we understand the dating of the book, is written to relatively young Christians who need discernment regarding the claims of false teachers. The attraction to it is understandable. Greater insight, increased strength, but the allurement must be exposed and avoided. And that's what Paul's doing. Knowing him, first of all, there's a provided fullness. And I hope you heard this as we went rather quickly through those verses because we've studied this book. A provided fullness, and we get that at salvation. At salvation. That's in verses 4 through 8. All that Paul did was reminded the Colossians of their own experience with the gospel. I love the simplicity of that. All he did was say, let me review with you what is true about you. Let me remind you when that started. Let me help you pass this, this detour, this allurement, knowing him a provided fullness at the point of salvation. Secondly, in a practical fullness through saturation. All I'm doing is taking Paul's prayer in verses 9 and 10 where he says what you really need is to understand what you have. That you might be filled with a knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You might walk worthy, be fruitful. If this is happening in your life, you will not be drawn into these, this false teaching. There's no need for something more but rather an understanding of what is ours in Christ. So first of all, we have initial life through gospel response. If you have trusted Christ, and many of us will reflect on that from time to time, we'll testify to other people about that, and we'll glory in the power of the gospel. We'll remember what happened. When somebody gave us the gospel, and it convicted us, and then God, because of what he had done through Christ, as we called out in repentant faith, he regenerated us and began transforming us. All that Paul is doing is reviewing that with them, initial life through gospel response. But secondly, there's an increased likeness through obedient faith. When he talks about walking worthy in verse number 10, don't miss this. He talks about walking worthy in the midst of how this greater understanding comes. As you, in faith, obey God, you continue to mature in your understanding of him. And so it's, it's almost seamless here because he's talking about, notice it in verse 9, that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Woven to that is that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. So that's obedient faith. And then he goes right back in the end of verse number 10 and increasing in the knowledge of God. How do you increase in the knowledge of God? By hearing from him and obeying him. And you just keep going forward, right? You just keep maturing. And so he wraps all that together before us to lead a life that's worthy of the Lord, that's fully pleasing to him, that bears fruit in every good work, allows us to increase in the knowledge of God. As we celebrate his dear son, it involves knowing him, a provided fullness at the point of salvation. Did you understand everything that you got in Christ at the point of salvation? No. Were you a theologian at the point of salvation? No. <laughs> Many of us were, were, were young. The point of salvation was the point in which all of this uh, took root, where the life came. That was given to us at salvation. But as we grow, as we're exposed to Christ, we're transformed from glory to glory. So there's a practical fullness that's through saturation, knowledge, understanding, spiritual insight. 
Initial life comes through gospel response. Increased likeness comes through obedient faith. You think about it. You know people that profess Christ and you watch them uh, um, become static. When did that happen? When they stopped obeying God. And they stopped obeying God. It's right here in what Paul's saying. I've watched it as a pastor. I've probed that a few times, trying to find out what, what's going on in your life. <laughs> Where are you saying no to God? Because I'm watching you stall out. I've said it many times. Let's go back to the place where you got off track. And let's deal with these things before God and let's get back on track. And Paul weaves that together here. To lead a life worthy of the Lord, full pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Secondly, overlap here, verse number 10, pleasing him. Now Paul says, first of all, there is an, avail there is an available power. There is an available power to us. Strengthen, verse number 11, with all might, according to his glorious power. Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power. Verse 11, there is a power available to us, and it's his power. It's his work in us. It's not some special power, some new height that we climb to. That's already ours. Resurrection power is what saved us. Secondly, he speaks of an observable glory, pleasing him. There's an available power and there is an observable glory. According to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, not feigned. Rather, soul level and overflowing. This glory comes from within, from the transformation, the spiritual character, the consistent Christ likeness. When God's having his way in our lives, the glory comes out. I always get nervous when people try to convince me how spiritual they are. Why are you having to do that? If you walk in with the Lord, won't that be evident? Won't it be evident for us? Won't the glory come out? I think Paul says that. Strength, first of all, strength manifested through a calm persistence. Now, all I'm doing is taking the words of verse 11 unto all patience. That's a word that has to do with endurance, as you know. We've studied that together. A calm persistence, a consistency in our lives, a spiritual settledness, we might say. And then he uses this phrase. Long suffering with joyfulness. So, secondly, not only strength manifested through a calm persistence, but sainthood evidenced through joyous self restraint. Long suffering, the idea of self restraint in our words and actions, the idea of being long suffering with other people. Making sure our conversation, our communication is edifying. No, Paul says, don't let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth. So there's that patience, there's that endurance, there's that steadiness in the end of verse 11. But there's also this long suffering with joyfulness, which has the idea of a self-restraint, of being long suffering toward other people. Paul says, I I'm seeing fruit in your life I'm telling you that the Lord is at work and everything that you need, you have in him. And then lastly, there's resting in him in verses 12 to 14 that we will probably come back to in the future. But he says, first of all, that he has qualified us. You say, what, is, what do you mean by that? Well, verse number 12 says, giving thanks unto the father, which hath made us meet. The idea there is he's qualified us. He's made us suitable to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. But secondly, in verse number 13, he also delivered us. He has qualified us and he has delivered us. Okay, so there's some higher level we can live on. Paul says, no, you've been set free. 
You've been liberated. You've been delivered from the power of darkness. You've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son, the son of his love. What more could there be for us? So I would say to you tonight that all Christians enjoy a full, a full standing. A baby Christian that's two weeks old has everything I've got. <laughs> As everything you've got, full standing. Why? Because all that they have, all that they need, they received in Christ. There'll be spiritual maturity, but they have a full standing as a believer. And every Christian is, lastly, free indeed. You've been delivered. You've been translated into a whole different kingdom. You've been unshackled, we might say. You've been born again by the Holy Spirit of God and there is not something more that somebody is going to serve up to you that's going to add to what Christ has done for you. And there's always something coming down the pipe. But people come in here and they start spreading things and you think, where did that come from? Some obscure text somewhere. And that's all they want to talk about and think about. All Paul wants to talk about and think about is Christ. So don't try to sell anything other than Christ. There's nothing beyond Christ. Our hope is resting in Christ. And without meaning to, when we buy into there being something in addition to Christ, we end up diminishing Christ. And folks, if Christ alone is your foundation and you diminish him, what does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? And I would suggest that every works orient oriented religion out there, even Christians who have become works oriented in their mind and lives and their theology and thinking, it's because they do not understand that their hope, young man visiting the church Sunday, said to me, said, Pastor, do you believe in eternal security? I thought, I always think real fast in my mind about why is he asking this and where is he going with this and what's the right answer to this? And before I could do any of that, I simply said, if our salvation is resting in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, how could it not be secure? Right? And where it becomes insecure is when we start turning the attention somewhere else. How are you doing this week? Well, I don't feel very secure in that. How has Christ done? All settled, all done. And I know, Paul knew better than I will ever know, but Paul knew that people go to seed on that. Remember what he does in Romans? Now you're going to say, well, then sin should abound that grace may abound. <laughs> and Paul says, perish the thought. That is not the impact that grace will have on you. You understand grace and you will want to be like Christ. You won't want to try to take advantage of that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have consistently through these epistles riveted our attention on the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, I know I need that. And I suspect I speak to people tonight who understand they need that. And Father, we understand that this focus, this biblical focus, this Christ focus will in no way unsettle us. It'll actually protect us. It'll protect us against wrong teaching. It'll teach us and help us with discernment. It'll protect us from some kind of spiritual elitism where we act like we're living higher than the people around us. We know how Jesus feels about that. We know what he had to say to all that hypocrisy. All that self-righteousness. And yet, Father, every one of us has the potential of being there. Forgive us. Cleanse us from this idea that there's anything for us to glory in other than Christ. May this be settling to us. May we recognize where our faith is resting. And may we move forward this Christmas season, celebrating the Lord Jesus Christ, both in his eternal deity and glory in his incarnation, in his sinless life, in his cross payment, in his resurrection, ascension, and in his seating again on the throne of glory. I praise you and thank you for these things in Christ's name. Amen.